Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at the AISP conceptual framework or also known. Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at the IASP conceptual framework, also known as the framework. This topic is covered in an international accounting course and it's starting to be covered on the CPA exam, the FAR section. As always, I would like to remind you, my viewers, to connect with me on a professional level via LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, you should create one. It's very good for your professional image and networking ability. YouTube is where I house all my lectures. You want to subscribe to my YouTube, please like the videos, share them, put them in playlist, let the world know about them. If you're benefiting from my lectures, there are other people who might benefit as well, so please share the wealth. This is my Instagram account. Please follow me on Instagram as I'm trying to grow my following. This is my Facebook ID and I do have a Gumroad account with few CPA lessons and this is my website. So we're going to be talking today about the conceptual framework. What is the conceptual framework and why does it exist? Well, what's the reason? So, so why do we have a conceptual framework? Well, the reason is, is to, to, to develop accounting standard systematically. What is systematically means? In an organized way, in some, in some sort of a way that is consistent with, with, with what we're going to be establishing for ourselves. So otherwise, we, we don't create those standard uh, haphazardly. So there's a way that we follow. So basically, there's a theory. There's an underlying theory in preparing the, uh, the financial statements and an underlying theory that's going to help us establish the IFRS. So if they are concepts. Think of them theories underlying the preparation and presentation of the IFRS-based financial statements. So every time we need to set a new standard, every time we need to create a new IFRS, we want to make sure the new standard does not violate our conceptions, our theory of what we think accounting standard should be. Okay? So the, the framework helps the IASB in developing future standards. So when we develop a standard, we want to make sure we are looking at the, at the framework and we're not violating anything in the framework and if we need to revise existing standards. So it will help IASB in creating new standards and revising uh, new ones and revising old ones, sorry, not new ones. It is it, it, it assists preparers of financial statements. So let's assume you are a company and you are you are trying to see how should I how should I recognize a transaction. The IFRS does not have a clear guidance. Let's assume that's the case. Well you could look at the framework. You could look at the framework and see this is how the framework might interpret this. So assist preparers in dealing with topics that are not yet addressed in the IFRS. So if there's something new it's not yet addressed you could look at the framework and we talked about this framework in the prior session when we talked about IFRS 1. We said first kind of in a hierarchy first is the IFRS then after the IFRS, we could look at the framework if there is no true IFRS. So the framework is something we could look at when there is no existing IFRS to deal with a certain issue. It was first developed in 1989 by the IASC before the IASB was created and was reaffirmed by the newly formed IASB in 2001. And we're going to look at it from a four different perspective. It covers four different areas. Now, in the real world, the framework is composed, I believe, of eight different chapters. So if you look at the actual framework, if you go to the IASB website or if you download the framework, it's basically it's eight chapters. But we're going to be taking those chapters and combining them into four different areas. The first one is the objective of financial statements and underlying assumptions. Kind of we talked about this when we looked at IFRS 1. The qualitative characteristics that affect the usefulness of financial statements, basically they, they clearly spell out what type of characteristics, specifically qualitative characteristics, that are useful, that are good when we prepare financial statements. Those are very general definitions, but they apply in, 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 in almost all situations. We also are going to look at definitions, recognition, and measurement of financial statement elements. What are the elements? Basically, what constitute the financial statements? Assets, liabilities, um, equity, revenues, and expenses. How do we define? How do we recognize? How do we measure those elements? We're going to look at we're going to look at it here. And at the end, we would look at the concept of financial capital and physical capital maintenance. As usual, when, once I have a list, I'm going to go over this list 
uh, in detail, so we will cover each concept separately. The first one, as I talked about, kind of we covered already um, the objective of financial statements and the underlying assumption. First of all, what are the objective of financial statements? Why do we prepare financial statements? Well, we prepare financial statements to provide information to the users useful information to the decision making the users now who are the decision making now the decision making could be anyone creditors investors government suppliers citizens anyone that uses the financial statements is a potential user but specifically what we focus on is in our investors so basically those are like the main group why because they commit capital they commit their money they risk their money when they invest in a company therefore when we prepare information we need to address their concern Okay, so to meet the objective of decision usefulness, financial statements must be prepared on a cruel basis. So that's another thing we need to do is prepare financial statement, not on cash basis, based on a cruel basis. Now, a cruel basis, the assumption is it's going to give us more information about the future. Why? Because we have accounts such as accounts payable, accounts receivable. Any accounts receivable tells us how much potential cash we could receive in the future. Accounts payable tell us how much potential cash we need to pay in the in the future as well. So the accrual basis is assumed to be superior in terms of predicting the future of the company. That's why we use, we use accrual basis. Therefore, the, the framework says we need to use accrual basis. Okay. Also, the financial statements should also show the results of the management stewardship of the enterprise resources. But that's not the primary objective. But the financial statement should tell us how well management is handling the company's assets, managing the company's liability, managing the cash flow. How well are they uh, are they running the company in order to produce profit for the investors? So this is another another uh, another underlying assumption. The other underlying assumption that we use is we have to assume that the company is a going concern. We prepare the financial statements assuming a going concern. What is a going concern? Going concern means we are preparing the financial statements under the assumption that the company will exist in the near future, in the future. So that's why when we do depreciation, when we buy an asset, we assume we're gonna depreciate this asset over seven years or over eight years or over 10 years. Why? Well, because we're going to be exist, we're going to exist in the future. Also, when we amortize a bond premium or a bond discount, well, what we're implying is we're going to exist. Therefore, we are amortizing, we are discounting um, the bond and amortizing the discount. So this is the objective and underlying assumptions. Again, this is, I believe, chapter one or chapter two. I believe this is mostly chapter one in the real framework. Qualitative characteristic, this I believe this will be chapter two. What are the qualitative characteristics? Basically, the framework spells out certain characteristics that the framework, that, that, the, uh, that the preparers of financial statements or the accounting uh, standard setting uh, institution should follow, okay? There are four that makes the financial statements information useful. First is understandability. What does that mean? What does understandability mean? It means when you prepare financial statements, someone with reasonable knowledge of financial information should be able to understand it. So when you prepare an income statement, someone with minimal or reasonable financial knowledge should understand what revenue is, what expenses are, revenues minus expenses equal to profit. Okay, so understandability means they are, they're not complicated. You don't need to hire someone in order to be able to understand them. As long as you have reasonable financial knowledge, you could always hire someone, but as long as you have reasonable financial knowledge, you should be able to manage, okay? Or at least ask the right questions. The second characteristic that makes the financial statement useful is relevant. The information that you provide has to be relevant. Now, what does relevant mean? Relevant means the information that you provide, it's going to help the users make predictions, help the users make prediction of the future, specifically cash flow, because what you're interested in, in cash flow. For example, when we report account receivable, we report account receivable at the net realizable value, how much we expect to receive in the future. That's a relevant information. Why? Because you're telling me how much I sold on credit and how much I expect to receive in the future in terms of cash flow. So it's going to help me make a prediction. That's relevant information for me. Also, it's used to confirm expectation. Well, I predicted that I'm going to be receiving 90% of my receivable. At the end of the period, I look at my cash and I see that I received 92 or I received 88. It either confirmed my expectation or I'm going to adjust my expectation. Now, the information ha has to be relevant and 
the nature of the information is important and materiality are a factor in relevancy. What does that mean? Let's talk about materiality first. Materiality, simply there's, there's no really um, a, a black and white definition for materiality, but simply put, if something is material, it means it's gonna make it's going to make a change. It's going to affect your decision. So you should not emit anything that is material. But if something is not material, it's okay if you don't if you don't clearly state it. And mat in material items, so if the items are immaterial, you, you are allowed to aggregate those items if they are in in material, not material. Now, the nature of the material, the nature of the item is important. What does the nature mean? Let's assume you are going to misstate a minimal. A minimum a figure let's assume it's twenty thousand dollar so your profit is going to be misstated by twenty thousand dollar okay so it's twenty thousand dollar material well first it depends on your company if you are making billions of dollars and you misstated twenty thousand dollar in revenue it's not a big deal okay it's not a big deal because the amount is immaterial now if you are making three hundred thousand dollar in profit and you misstated twenty to twenty five thousand in revenue I would say that will be material. That's the materiality. But again, there is no clear cut. Uh, materiality is materiality uh, differ bet between users. So that's why we, you don't define it. But the nature of the figure is important. Let's assume you are going to borrow money from the bank and you, you are misstating your profit by 20,000. Okay, maybe 20,000 is not a material number for your overall company because your company is making um, six million dollars in profit. Okay, but that $20,000 took you from a profit, from a loss to a profit. So because you misstated that $20,000, it took you from a loss to a profit. And let's assume that bank only lend money for profitable companies. So simply put, the $20,000 is not material because it's a small amount because you're making, um, you know, uh, you have six million dollars in uh, in revenues, so twenty thousand dollars is not a big deal. But in this, in, in, under the circumstances, the nature of it, it took you from a loss that twenty thousand dollar put you into a profit. And in turn, what happened? The bank, the bank agreed to lend you money. Well, under those circumstances, you are not really providing relevant information. Therefore, materiality is important, but also the nature of the materiality, the nature of the component. Another use, another information that makes the financial statement useful, another characteristic to be more specific, is reliability. And hopefully reliability is a self-explanatory. It means I can rely on the information. What does it mean if I can rely on the information? It means the information is truthful. It means the information has that faithful representation. It's really telling me what actually happened. Okay, it's giving me the substance over the form. Also reliability means it's neutral. It's not favoring one party over the other. What does it mean favoring one party over the other? For example, if you have investors and creditors, investors are interested in profit because investors share in the profit of the company. Creditors, on the other hand, are not interested in the profit as much as they are interested in capital maintenance. And creditors, all what they want is they want to make sure you pay them back their money plus interest. They don't care if you make billions of dollars because they're not going to share into the profit. So when you provide information, the information that you provide has to be reliable and part of reliability has to be neutral, free of bias. It doesn't, it doesn't show uh, a certain picture for a certain group over other. So that's what reliability is. Again, it has to be faithful representation. It's really telling you exactly what happened. Okay, economic substance over, over legal form. Substance means what really happened. Legal form is on paper, this is what happened, but what really happened behind the scene is, or the, the, the heart of the transaction is different than what it looks like. Therefore, show me the substance, that don't, don't look at the form. Also, another useful characteristic of financial information is comparability. Well, what, why is comparability important? Because when you analyze companies, you want to analyze companies over a period of time. And if the company is using different accounting method, or applying different accounting standards from period to period, then I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be comparing apples to oranges. So comparability means apply the same accounting method from from period to period. Now, if you happen to change those methods, please disclose. Let me know that you changed them. Therefore, I will make the appropriate assumption. So if you're changing your depreciation method, if if you're changing your inventory method, just let me know. Also, what is what is part of reliability is conservatism. Conservatism basically is measuring accounting element 
uh, conservatism in measuring accounting elements. What does that mean? It means if you have a doubt whether to treat something as an asset or an expense, because every time you spend money, well, you have to decide, am I going to treat this transaction as an asset? Did I acquire an asset, something that's going to benefit me in the future? We're going to talk about asset next. Or is this an expense? Expense means it's going to, it's going to go on the income statement. And from a financial statement perspective, expense has no future value because I expense it. So if you have to choose between an expense and an asset, well, if you're conservative, you treat the expenditure as an expense. Okay. So this is what we mean by conservatism. If you have any doubt, um, if, you, if you have any doubt, you always take the conservative route. Okay. Now you cannot create hidden reserve or excessive provisions to, deli to, to deliberately understand understate income. So what happened using this conservatism, what some companies or what some managers would do if they have some good years, if they are making a lot of profit this year, what they try to do, they will try to create reserves or provisions for losses. So what they do is say, okay, since we have a lot of profit this year, let's debit and ask, debit a loss, create a liability as a provision for future losses like bad debt expense or warranties. Why? What happened is when the following year kicks in and when that bad debt expense or that warranty does not materi materialize, they reverse it. And as they reverse it, they will reduce their expenses. So creating those hitting or excessive provisions is not acceptable under the concept of conservatism. Conservatism means if you have a doubt about a transaction, how to record it, take the conservative way, only if you have a doubt, okay? Otherwise, if you are creating, if you are creating excessive reserve on purpose or hitting reserve, then that's basically misleading the financial users and that's not really quality of, uh, it's not a quality of reliability. The next thing we're gonna look at as definitions, recognition, and measurement of financial statement elements. And this is important, um, whether you are a introductory accounting student or um, you are an advanced accounting student, you want to make sure you understand the elements of financial statements. And the elements of financial statements are assets, liabilities, revenues, expenses. So we want to make sure we understand how we measure them, how do we recognize them. So starting with assets, assets are defined as resources controlled by an enterprise from which future economic benefit are expected to flow to the enterprise. So simply put, you have something, whatever that something is, you control it, you have, you can use it like a building, inventory, cash in the bank, and that's going to possibly benefit your company. Not for sure, it's expected. Now you might have inventory, but if you sell them at a loss, that's not benefit to you. Other, other detailed definition of assets is the assets, you don't have to own it. For example, if you lease an asset, well, that's fine. If you lease a a vehicle, a truck, a building, you can control the use of it. It's considered an asset. Asset should have a cost or a value that can be measured reliably. So every time you add an asset, you have to use a value. So I'm going to increase an asset and let's assume I'm paying cash, I will credit cash. So every time you put an asset on the books, it has to have a reliable measure. You have to measure it in terms of a dollar amount or whatever currency you are using. Okay. Now, the way you measure it, okay, may be used on uh, historical cost, for example, if you buy supply, you would use historical cost to measure it. Um, you could use current cost. For example, IFRS allows you to use current cost for PP&E or fair value, realizable value. If you're using account receivable, you would use a realizable value. Sometimes you can use present value, which is for notes receivable. So notice how you measure the asset. It used to be only historical cost, then there is movements toward fair value measurement okay so so there's different measurement how you measure your assets how you measure your assets on depends on different asset another elements of the financial statements important element is liabilities what are liabilities liabilities are present obligation you have an obligation right now arising from a past event because something happened in the past that expected to settle with an outflow of resources usually what's that outflow of resources you have to pay cash. You have to pay cash in the future. If you have a liability, you have to pay cash. Now, obligation need not to be contractual to be treated as an as a liability. So you don't have to have a contract. Sometimes you might have to estimate a liability. Okay. Sometimes a liability is contingent upon future event. So it doesn't have to be written down contractual. Okay. Liability should be recognized when it's probable, notice probable, that an outflow of resource would re will be required to settle them and the amount can be measurably be me measured reliably. So as long as you think you are going to pay for it and you know how much you're going to pay for it, guess what? You have a liability. Okay. 
And how do you measure liabilities? There are different ways to measure liabilities, just like assets. Uh, you could measure liability at the amount proceeds received in exchange for the obligation. For example, you receive inventory and you have to pay um, $50,000 for it, then that's your accounts payable. That's your liability measure at the exchange, how much you exchange your inventory with accounts payable, $50,000. The amount that would be required to settle an obligation currently, for example, the pension, the pension is measured at how much would you have to, uh, uh, how much would you have to pay today if you have to settle it. That's the one way to measure to measure liability. Undiscounted settlement value in the normal course of business. If you have a short-term loan, you would record it at the undiscounted settlement value because it has a very short period. Or liability can be recorded at the present value of the future cash flow. Like if you have a bond or a long-term note. How much do you record today? Well, I'm going to record today how much is the present value of the future cash flow. Okay, and we'll see this later on, but hopefully you know this information already. Other definitions for elements of financial statements, income and expenses are the two elements that constitute profit. So now we're moving to the little bit more to the income statement or to the equity side of things. Um, what is income? What is income? Income encompass both revenues and gains. And how do we define what's something revenue or gain if it increases in equity other than transaction from owners? So every time your equity increases, okay, other than the owner is giving you money, then that's considered an income or a, either an income or a gain. Income should be recognized uh, with the increase in an asset or a decrease in a liability measured reliably. So. How do you measure income? Well, you measure income, how much assets did you receive? Or sometimes you don't increase asset. You just have to, as long as you reduce your liability, let's assume you owe me, um, you owe me $50, just to make it simple. I would say, okay, if you paint my home, if you paint my bedroom, I would, uh, I would relieve you from the debt. Well, you do so, guess what? I have revenue. Why? Because uh, you have revenue. I'm sorry, I don't have revenue. Uh, you have revenue, why? Because it, it's it's as if I gave you fifty dollars in revenue, then you, and then you gave it back to me. So if I reduce your liability, that's revenue to you. Okay, expenses, including losses, are decreases in equity other than distribution to owners. So when is something considered an expense or a loss? Well, guess what? If it's if I'm reducing, if my equity is going down, other than dividend other than dividend, because dividend also reduces equity, but dividend is transaction with the owners. If my equity is going down with transaction other than distribution to owners, then that's an expense, okay? Expenses are recognized when the related decrease in asset or increase in liability. So when you incur an expense, either your assets will go down, like you pay it in cash, or you give something, like you give them inventory, you give them supplies, whatever you do, you give up some cash, uh, some asset, most of the time you pay your expenses with cash, or oftentimes, not oftentimes, the other possibility is you have an expense, but you're going to pay for it in the future. Then what's that going to do? It's going to increase your liability. It's going to increase your liability. So an expense is reflected by either decreasing cash or increasing liability. Kind of the opposite of an asset. An asset, you're, I'm sorry, the opposite of a revenue. In a revenue situation, your asset goes up and your liability goes down. And how is equity defined? Well, equity defined is assets minus liability, asset minus liability. Remember, equity is increased by revenue, reduced by expenses. Hopefully you know this. The last concept we're going to be covering is the financial capital maintenance concept and the physical capital maintenance concept. So let's take a look at the definition of financial capital maintenance. And hopefully I'm going to keep this very simple because many students find difficulty understanding this concept. Um, whatever, you know, for whatever reason you are watching this, um, if you're watching this for the CPA exam or for ACCAA exam or whatever exam is, the topic is not covered heavily, but you have to know what it is. So I'm, we're going to go through it anyhow. So how do we measure if it's a financial capital maintenance? We look at the profit as we, we looked at, we look at the profit as the amount of the amount earned. Okay. Profit is the earned only if the amount of net asset at the end of the period exceeds the amount at the beginning of the period, excluding any inflow from or outflow to owners. Um, net asset is basically equity. Okay, what does that mean? It means if I'm measuring my profit, I'm going to look at the net, the change in my net asset. If my net asset went up from the beginning of the period till the end of the period, then I have a profit. 
okay what does that mean let's assume I started my own company and I invested $100 okay so my cash went up my common stock went up so at the beginning of the period I'm gonna keep it simple so how much equity do I have or net asset only $100 okay asset minus liabilities equal to equity I only have no liabilities let's assume I took this 40 that uh, I took 50 uh, let's make it $40 let's assume I took $40 and I purchase inventory with it. So my cash now is 60. Okay, so I have cash of 60, inventory of 40. I still have $100 in assets, and I still have $100 of common stock, which is, which is I'm still in, in the same position. Now, I bought this inventory, and let's assume I sold this inventory for $50. Okay, if I sold this inventory for $50, now my cash, my cash is 100, I sold all the inventory. Now all what I have is cash 110, common stock of 100, and I'm gonna keep this profit. I'm not gonna pay it in dividend and retained earning. I'm gonna close the profit to retained earning. I have $10 profit because I sold it for 10. So now, and let's assume that's the only thing that happened throughout the year. So notice, I started the year with $100 in equity. I ended up with, sorry, 110. That's the whole purpose of to show you the increase. I end up the year with 110. So notice, I started the year with 100 in cash, 100 in common stock. I ended up the year with 100 of equity, basically 110 in equity. From a financial capital maintenance perspective, I am better off. I have a profit of $10. So this is how we measure financial capital maintenance. Okay, now, how do we measure? So the financial capital maintenance, although it's a fancy word, it's what you learned in financial accounting. This is what we do, because it's easier to measure financial capital maintenance. If we are looking at physical capital maintenance, if we're measuring the profit from a physical capital maintenance, it implies that a profit is earned only if the enterprise productive or operating capacity at the end of the period exceeds the capacity at the beginning of the period, including, um, excluding, obviously, we don't, anything to do with owners contribution or distribution from the owners so let's use the same example i started with with one hundred dollars i bought some inventory i sold it i, I bought for inventory for 50. Uh, I, I bought it for 40 sold it for 50. now i'm going to add a little bit more details here now when i when i invested this 40 dollars i bought i bought 40 units of this inventory what does that mean? It pays. It means I paid one dollar per unit. So my cost was one dollar per unit. Okay. Let's assume by the end of the year, I decided to buy this forty units of inventory because I sold them. I made a ten dollar profit. Let's assume I need to rebuy that forty units. Guess what? Now, if I need to buy 40, 40 units, I have to pay eighty dollars. Why eighty dollars? Because the cost of each unit went up. So there was. There was a huge price increase. The, 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 the cost of my inventory doubled. So what happened to my productive capacity? My productive capacity went down. Now, if I have to buy the, the same 40 units, I have to invest $80. It means I, did, I really did not make any profit. Why? Because my productive capacity went down. So this is, if you are looking from a company for a, from the physical capital maintenance, I did not really make a profit because my productive or up our operating capacity at the end of the period did not exceed, okay? With the same asset, I could have bought 40 units. I can no longer do so. Now I can, if I wanna invest $40 now, if I'm gonna take my $40, if I'm gonna take my $40, I can only buy 20 units with my $40. I can only buy 20 units. So my capacity, my capacity, my operating capacity decreased my operating capacity decrease. So this is the difference between financial capital maintenance and physical capital maintenance. As accountant, we look at financial capital maintenance. Again, there is, you can talk about inflation here, but we're not gonna go into this, uh, into, the, into more details other than this. Um, but this is basically it about the conceptual framework of the IASV. If you have any questions about this topic, please email me. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures, please consider donating. Good luck and study hard.